hello, uh, my name is Alexey Brodkin, and uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, one quite funny experience I've got investigating story of debugging of uh, one uh, problem throughout multiple software stacks. So uh, in recent years, the uh, term full stack developer became very widely used in areas uh, typically connected to web development. And uh, there you have front end developers who are typically responsible for whatever happens on the user's uh, web browser on his or her site. Uh, you have backend developers who are dealing with the server side of your application, and so you have uh, somebody else uh, who is called a uh, full stack developer. So that's the person who may deal with anything with front end, with back end, whatever. But uh, generally speaking, that kind of classification is applicable to much more uh, areas, not only web development. And in fact, a Wikipedia page, uh, which talks about full stack developer, uh, says that, uh, I will cite here, in computing a solution stack or software stack is a set of software subsystems or components needed to create a complete platform such that no additional software is needed to support applications. And so full stack developer is expected to be able to work in all the layers of the stack. And so I think uh, you'll see that that's pretty much the case here. Uh, and that's exactly what I really meant uh, composing the title of my presentation. We will literally go uh, uh, or take a journey from a very high level software, which in our case is open source automation server Jenkins, and so down to the uh, guts of the Synopsis proprietary instruction set simulator. Uh, those you see uh, ISS, which stands for Instruction Set Simulator in the title. So now when the title uh, is explained, uh, let's get started finally. Uh, so first, let me introduce myself. Uh, again, my name is Alexey Brodkin. I work for Synopsys and I've been working there for more than 10 years now. And so I reside in uh, St. Petersburg, Russia. And in the company, I'm responsible for development of different uh, runtime software, including different operating systems, uh, such as uh, Linux kernel and so uh, some Artosis in particular, uh, Zephyr Artos. And so uh, Zephyr is one of the important projects uh, on which we are working on uh, these days quite heavily. Uh, even though personally I'm not uh, full-time busy with Zephyr development, I'm trying to help my colleagues uh, solving challenging problems, especially where it helps to have a broader uh, view on different technologies and different uh, software parts, and not only software, but sometimes even hardware. And so uh, this presentation will be uh, about exactly one, uh, that kind of situation uh, where I uh, decided to help my colleagues and do something useful in the end. Uh, but before I move to the real meat of that presentation, I'd like to, uh, to thank my colleagues uh, without whom uh, that presentation wouldn't happen and uh, because uh, they helped me a lot uh, from debugging and so sometimes even just uh, with uh, suggestions were during hot discussions on the kitchen. Uh, and in particular, I'd like to mention our master of automation, uh, Mikhail Falaleev and our Jenkins Instance Administrator, Ilya Yevsienkov. So uh, uh, at this point, I think we are ready for, uh, to go for the technical part of the presentation. Uh, today, we are going to talk about uh, debugging uh, one of the interesting problems we faced during automated testing of Zephyr RTOS on uh, simulated ARC platforms. And uh, that's why we'll start uh, from very uh, brief explanation of what that uh, thing uh, really is. I mean, uh, Zephyr RTOS and so uh, why that all happened in the first place. And then we'll see uh, how the problem uh, was initially observed. Uh, from that, uh, we'll uh, go through a couple of steps uh, on uh, how we got to the bottom of uh, that, or to the root cause of that problem, how we figure out what, what is actually going on. And then uh, we'll uh, go slightly back, trying to figure out how to live with that, how to solve that problem, how to uh, get our setup up, up and running back again. And so uh, obviously in the very end, uh, we'll come up with a couple of uh, notes or suggestions which might be useful in those kind of situations. Uh, so uh, uh, why Zephyr? Uh, that's a good question. And so uh, as I see it, so Zephyr is rap rapidly evolving real-time operating system, which is developed by a brilliant community. Uh, 
And compared to many other art sources uh, which we have currently on the market, uh, Zephyr consists not only uh, of a simple uh, task scheduler, memory management and interrupt handling uh, part, but it actually accommodates a lot of different things and uh, quite uh, complex uh, software subsystems like Bluetooth, networking, crypto, and uh, a lot of different, different things. Uh, to add to that, uh, we also have in Zephyr a lot of uh, device drivers, uh, which you typically won't find on, in uh, other uh, real-time operating systems. And we have support in upstream uh, source tree for, for multiple uh, different boards and multiple architectures. Uh, that makes Zephyr very uh, convenient and very useful uh, when you are going to uh, develop your new real-life application, because that's easy, you have everything just uh, Pretty probably adds a couple of bits for your particular platform for your board, uh, because most probably even your SOC is already supported, or you may add it support easily if your architecture is supported. And then you uh, keep using uh, available libraries and available components and builds uh, just your business logic in your application and you are done with, with that. Uh, speaking about uh, ARC and Synops involvement into the process, uh, so our processors were supported from the very uh, first public commit of uh, Zephyr and currently we're working hard uh, trying to uh, support what we have and so add, uh, adding newer features. We add support of uh, new processors, uh, feature hardware features which are not supported, we add uh, software features and work uh, on whatever is uh, available and becoming available in upstream. Uh, sources. Uh, so yeah, that, that's good, that's interesting, and uh, a lot of interesting things are happening that. And uh, as I said, the first development is moving very rapidly, very fast. And so, uh, for example, last month we saw uh, more than 900 commits uh, merged into the main uh, source tree, and those were changed from 140 plus uh, developers. So you may uh, think how many of those uh, changes happen, like uh, 30 commits per day, and that's quite a lot. Some of them might not be just one line change. And that basically means uh, rate of change is uh, huge. And uh, with uh, so many different changes, it is very hard to make sure that uh, even whatever used to work yesterday still works today. And obviously the only way to make sure that uh, your stuff still works is uh, to test it again and again and again and do it uh, as fast, uh, as rapidly as possible possible. Uh, ideally, you would do that on each and every uh, commit, but in case of Zephyr, we uh, deal with uh, typically not commits, but pull requests. So these are a, one or a couple of commits uh, which are accepted together as uh, one logical substance. And in Zephyr community, uh, we already have a very nice, very powerful uh, CI infrastructure, uh, which exactly does that. So it builds uh, for, uh, if not, but if not uh, for all, but at least for a major uh, amount of boards supported in upstream Zephyr. And so for them, we build a lot of different tests and that obviously happens automatically. And then on some of the boards, uh, uh, tests are being executed. Uh, now speaking about uh, uh, why we need execution because well what uh, got built is not necessarily will work uh, when you execute it and uh, then that execution typically happens in uh, boards which are based on QMU emulator. And so the reason is uh, QMU is free, you may uh, even build it yourself, uh, you may uh, introduce patches uh, which uh, fix stuff that you need and so, so it could be easily deployed in, uh, in independent open source CI and so that's what is done in Zephyr so that's good. But uh, the thing is uh, uh, QMU is not the only type of boards which we support. We have our proprietary simulator, we have uh, multiple different boards uh, for which we also need to make sure that uh, they work. And so uh, obviously what works on one platform may not work for on another, especially if it is not only uh, differs uh, by name, but it has different configuration of uh, peripherals. It, it may even have different configuration of the CPU itself. And in case of ARC, that might very well be the case because our cores are very configurable. And so that means uh, whatever we have in upstream CI is good, but we want more. And so we cannot imagine having all the boards tested in upstream CI. And so that's why uh, every vendor, every developer, uh, 
uh, end up uh, end up building their their own uh, uh, CI farm or CI infrastructure. So uh, that's how we uh, got in that business of uh, having and running our in-house CI. And so in our case, uh, due to different reasons, uh, we used to, we use Jenkins as uh, the major automation server for that. And so that's uh, one of the most popular open source software for those kind of things. And so, so why not? That's a good thing. Uh, okay, so uh, we talked about that. And uh, so how that testing is done in, in Zephyr. Uh, in Zephyr, except uh, for uh, code, so which does uh, something useful and uh, like kernel itself, uh, different libraries and drivers. We also have a lot of different uh, different tests and samples, and so that is uh, also uh, another important difference uh, to other uh, real time operating so. Uh, operating systems that we have uh, currently available, because uh, for for uh, a lot of different subsystems, for a lot of drivers, for a lot of boards and uh, different parts of the tree, uh, we we try to create tests. Some exist and some we add uh, whenever we decide that uh, it is needed. And so that's uh, in the end gives us uh, a couple of hundred uh, different tests, which covers uh, different parts of the uh, Zephyr RTOS. And so it's not only that, again, in, in many cases, you may have different tests and examples, but uh, you would rarely use them because for that you need to do some special steps and so, uh, well, you're just lazy enough to do that. But in case of Zephyr, we don't only, uh, we not only have those tests itself, but we have also testing infrastructure, uh, which uh, through execution of just one single uh, script, one single uh, Python, uh, script, you get a lot of uh, those tests executed. So uh, basically what uh, that thing does. Uh, first, uh, depending on the platform you are focused, you may build like everything, everything for all the uh, boards which are supported so, and so all the tests which are supported on that, those boards, or you may uh, just specify a couple of uh, platforms of your interest or a couple of tests that you want uh, to look at. And so then that's a script which is called uh, sanity check, uh, I think for a good reason. It's uh, basically, uh, builds those tests uh, which are uh, which were filtered by your platform once uh, you specified uh, tests uh, and then uh, once they are built so if uh, uh, execution is going to happen because you specified a uh, simulator platform or sets uh, a specially instructed sanity check to do execution on boards I think it is done like with minus minus board checking but anyways there is quite a good documentation where you may uh, check all the uh, parameters which you may want to use. Uh, so uh, when uh, when there is uh, a need to, to run something, that uh, same scripts will uh, execute tests as well. And uh, again, it is not only executing tests, it actually uh, captures uh, test outputs and uh, tries to figure out if that test was execution uh, correctly or not. Again, that's quite a difference compared to many other things where you need to do that manually or write your own scripts. Here uh, you get uh, sanity check executed and then uh, in the end you get uh, something like that. So, so uh, you see uh, some a summary which gets you uh, uh, quite a good understanding of uh, what is actually going on. If you are doing well or not, that's well. Uh, and so, yes, yeah, so uh, now uh, if we uh, move forwards and uh, look at uh, that uh, sanity check output so uh, that uh, we just discussed, you may actually see that uh, there are a couple of problems. Well, uh, in fact, not a couple, but uh, quite a few. You see 17 tests uh, failed. Uh, that's not something uh, we want to have. Uh, uh, another interesting thing, so obviously whenever we get uh, those kinds of results or any failure, we, we try to reproduce that locally and uh, beauty of that sanity check, uh, there's the same comments which you may use in automated infrastructure, you may do it on your own machine. So we try to reproduce that problem, uh, but so surprisingly on, uh, even if we run it on local machine or on the same server where automation is uh, running, uh, we are not able to reproduce that. And so so, uh, well, that's, uh, that makes uh, debugging of those failures uh, not that easy. 
uh, now speaking of the CI itself, uh, it is, uh, I think, the most useful thing when you have exactly zero failures. Uh, typically observed uh, in executions in your CI, uh, because then it is very, uh, very easy to figure out uh, when problem got introduced. So yesterday had clean results, so today have some failures, so you know where the difference came from. Obviously, that, that, that's a difference uh, which was not in sources yesterday and since today. And even if you have like even 10 different uh, commits or 10 pull requests, that's quite easy to um, bisect it uh, to the one which introduce the problem, but then you deal with that. In the best case, you just ask a developer who introduced that uh, or submitted that change uh, to take a look. And so uh, these, these are some symptoms. So please take a look at that. But uh, uh, then on the other side, uh, if you have uh, failures uh, in your CI, uh, which you cannot explain and moreover, not one failure, but many of them, moreover, not just many of them, but uh, you have different uh, amount of failures uh, from, from execution to execution, that makes that CI system completely uh, useless. Uh, I, at least that's, that's my opinion on that subject, uh, because that gives you no idea on uh, what is actually going on. Are you uh, uh, getting better with uh, your project of interest or uh, you are getting worse. Nobody knows because uh, today you have plus one uh, failure, yesterday you had uh, minus five failures. So what does that uh, really tell you? I think nothing and uh, people just stop uh, looking at that at all. And uh, I think needless to say that we were getting exactly in that business because we got uh, those 10, uh, from 10 to 20 tests sporadically uh, failing and so uh, we uh, we had no idea why that ha why that was happening and so uh, because uh, we still wanted to get some use of that so ci setup uh, somebody had to buy the bullet uh, and so uh, since everybody else was busy with different other things i decided to to give it a try and so uh, okay looks like i was successful with that uh, so uh, with all sets uh, we are now ready to start our journey through the software stack but uh, uh, we'd better be well prepared uh, for that long trip. Uh, so uh, since we were not able to reproduce that same problem manually, it was not even clear which part of the CI process affects uh, test execution. And uh, we started from full-blown uh, CI job, which was uh, doing uh, checkout of sources, uh, then building, then running, uh, and so everything was done from scratch all the time. And uh, even though that uh, uh, allowed us to have that uh, pro simple production, uh, simple scenario for a production, uh, it was still not very convenient because turnaround time was about uh, half an hour. And so uh, whenever you do a change, you need to wait uh, that amount of time. And also given it was in the CI uh, environments, uh, whenever you want to do some change, you had to do that in scripts and uh, then wait until completion, then do that yet another iteration that, uh, that was not very useful. And then you have to do with artifacts which you need to store properly because otherwise uh, CI machinery will get rid of that on next execution. So, so it was uh, quite inconvenient. But anyways, uh, uh, to uh, uh, make faster progress, uh, we decided to to uh, make that execution time shorter because otherwise it just justifies coffee breaks but uh, doesn't allow you to be productive in solving your problem. And so we started to, uh, to, min to minimize the test case. We removed checkout of sources and so uh, that was useful. Uh, we decided to reuse the same uh, source which we already have and so uh, we had a number of execution of that full uh, uh, flow. We, figure, uh, we figured out that uh, we have uh, at least one test which will reliably fails and so uh, platform which was used for that. And so, so we had a test case uh, which allowed us to reproduce the problem in 30 seconds. So again, this is important because it allows you to, to try different things much faster and move uh, forward. Uh, yeah, so uh, that was already a, a good, good progress. But uh, then when we uh, agreed, okay, so there is a test uh, which we are going to work on. Uh, let's see what we can get uh, from actually execution of that thing. Uh, typically, sanity check uh, would output uh, something like that. Uh, 
So that will be a typical error in normal execution of sanity check. It is not very verbose, but okay, it, it uh, allows, uh, gives you some idea. It uh, shows you the test which fails and uh, at least one reason. So it might be build failure. Here it is, you see a timeout. Okay, but uh, this is not all that's useful uh, because we need to want more uh, data on what's going on there. So we add uh, more verbosity to the sanity checker script. And at this point, we already see, okay, that was indeed timeout and execution lasts a little bit longer than 60 seconds. Uh, why uh, that 60 seconds? Because as we remember uh, that the timeout, so which is used by sanity check uh, to kill execution of the uh, simulator especially. And so that thing I wanted to mention, uh, when uh, sanity check executes a uh, test on real boards, nothing actually happens if we want to stop execution because what can we do? Boards will keep running and in the best case, we will reset that on the next uh, execution of the next test. Uh, we do that on uh, on our boards, at least. We try to do that. That helps to make sure that uh, you are starting from scratch and no internal states are causing you new problems. But in case of simulator, what uh, sanity checker actually does, it kills execution of the simulator, be it uh, QMU or NCM or anything else. So that's how it works. And so I think that will be uh, useful for us in our further, <clears throat> uh, further discoveries. Uh, but uh, then also uh, what's good about sanity checker, it is not only running stuff, but it dumps a lot of data in different logs. And in particular, there is a build log, uh, but uh, for us build was not a problem, but there, there is a handler log, basically that's a dump of the console, which is uh, captured by the sanity check. And so here we may see that indeed in the very end of execution, we were stuck uh, with uh, something that's an output of the test. That's okay. That's a normal part, but the problem is we stop here, we are not getting any project execution successful or fails. And so that's the problem. Okay, uh, so uh, um, at least we know that uh, for some reason, uh, we stopped uh, getting updates to that log. Okay, so what uh, might be the reason for that? So what uh, hypothesis we may have for that? Okay, so uh, the first thing uh, which comes to my mind is, uh, okay, maybe uh, data which, uh, which is being passed uh, by the simulator to the sanity check gets buffered somewhere. And so from my previous experience, I, and I think that's true for many embedded developers uh, and not only developers, not only embedded probably, we know that uh, standard outputs uh, get buffered quite often. And so there is good reason for that. We don't want uh, to uh, mess with each and every symbol which uh, gets printed, for example. So typically data, uh, gets buffered and then from time to time we uh, flush that buffer and so uh, our uh, letters appear on the screen in the terminal, our files uh, get written to the real uh, storage and so that's how it works. And apparently uh, it turned out that uh, in Python, which is used uh, in sanity check script, uh, sanity check is uh, written on Python. In Python there is a uh, this exactly the same concept and so uh, data will be buffered typically. Uh, and so uh, if you take a look on the uh, right parts of the screen of that presentation, you may see a very simple snippet uh, which demonstrates that behavior. So if you execute it as it is, uh, you will see printed print one, then print three, and only then print two, uh, which will be flushed on uh, completion of that script execution. And so uh, with, uh, Simple Googling, we figured out that, okay, there is a way to uh, get Python working in an un unbuffered manner. And so that's fine for that. So you just need to, to either export uh, Python unbuffered uh, environment variable or just add minus u to the uh, Python uh, command line. And so we tried that, but apparently that didn't have, that didn't help. Otherwise, uh, that presentation wouldn't happen at all. So uh, what would be our uh, next theory? Okay, so maybe a uh, simulator is dead by that time. And so uh, that's why we are not getting updates uh, out of it. Uh, to verify that hypothesis, uh, we'll use S-trace. 
And uh, S trace is a very powerful tool, which currently might be used not only as a tracer, but for many more other use cases. You may even introduce uh, expected uh, corruptions uh, in, in between your application and uh, system libraries and uh, Linux kernel. But uh, for that, I strongly advise to Google and uh, watch a couple of presentations made by Dmitry Levin, current maintainer of S trace. It has uh, those presentations. They have a lot of interesting insights and newer features, not very new features. And so that will definitely help you uh, one day. So please, please uh, go look for that and so watch them. And in a very simple case, uh, what S trace does, it's uh, you uh, start your application uh, through S trace or on top of S trace. And what happens uh, when your application is asking for some services from Linux kernel or from system libraries, it uh, basically uh, does a call to uh, those system libraries or uh, does a system call uh, execution uh, directly. And S trace captures that uh, request for syscall uh, execution, uh, system call. And so then it records that, then passes to the kernel, and so then records what kernel returns, and then passes that uh, content uh, to the application. So that's how uh, we get a very nice non-invasive uh, uh, look at what's going on in between your application and so underlying system. And so with that, what we are trying to do we are trying to figure out if our application is doing anything useful. Because if it is not looping in the uh, simple while loop or uh, not executing any instruction at all for some reason, like being halted uh, or being in sleep all the time, uh, most probably it will at least uh, try to read files from file system, try to get uh, some additional service, I don't know, ask for time or something like that. And uh, when we run our execution, uh, our uh, uh, our simulator uh, under S trace, we do see that uh, something is actually going on. A lot of things happen, so that suggests that our simulator is alive. Uh, a couple of other things I'd like to mention. Uh, so typically, uh, so if you execute S trace without additional parameters, it will uh, completely uh, ruin your console output because uh, it will you will have a lot of uh, output from S trace itself, which will be mixed by your output if you happen to output in in this here in this standard output, and you won't see anything. But uh, uh, then you may redirect it uh, to a to your uh, log file with minus O, your name of your log file. And also another uh, thing which I typically use uh, by default as trace will uh, only monitor your uh, parent process. And whenever uh, other processes get created or even threats are created in the, that process, their uh, events won't be captured. And typically I uh, run with minus S F flag, which stands for follow forks uh, to see what's going on uh, even in process which were spawned by uh, that parent process and so we'll see if it was a good idea or not. Uh, so yeah, we see that uh, simulator is alive and uh, that theory was uh, uh, not proven. So let's go uh, one level uh, uh, down again. And uh, if a simulator is still functional, so probably uh, our uh, model CPU is dead. And so how are we going to check if that's true or not? Uh, we may uh, just uh, record instructions being executed. And so looking at captured instruction traces, uh, fortunately, with that particular simulator, it is possible. Uh, we can make uh, at least uh, two conclusions. Uh, first, uh, trace keep growing, uh, which means uh, CPU is executed something. And so also, if we take a look at the uh, trace itself, uh, we may easily notice that at least we are not executing one simple loop, like uh, go to the next instruction and then jump, jump to the previous one and looping in that uh, uh, cycle again and again. We are not seeing that. Probably there is a larger loop, but you cannot uh, tell it looking at lows uh, at least we, with your own eye. Uh, okay, so so that's a good thing. Uh, and uh, okay, uh, so uh, we see that uh, something is going on in our simulator. So at least it is not that. Uh, but uh, 
there is uh, uh, another interesting observation. Since we were not able to reproduce that locally, but we were able to, rep to reproduce that in the automated setup, uh, what we may do, we may try to capture two different traces, one uh, in a local setup uh, where we know that execution is correct and one from the uh, incorrect execution in automated setup, and then just compare two logs and see if uh, we are getting anything interesting out of that. And so, so we do, uh, and uh, what uh, I'd like to note here, that's actually not, the not all the simulators are uh, born equal. So for example, uh, aforementioned QMU, uh, which has a lot of different benefits, but uh, there are a couple of downsides. One of them, uh, it uh, cannot uh, record trace of execution target instructions. And the reason for that is in the first uh, letter Q in its name, which stands for quick. Uh, to be quick, what it does, it implements something like JIT or just-in-time compilation. Uh, basically what it does, it splits uh, target codes, uh, target instruction, uh, instructions in so-called basic blocks. Uh, that's a, that's a couple of instructions uh, which are executed all the time linearly and linearly and so then that block gets converted to the host instructions uh, keeping the same semantics of entire block and so then uh, the next execution of that basic block happens with substitution of uh, that uh, those target instructions with host instructions which means we cannot actually dump instructions executed by the target at all uh, probably except for the first time but in that typically it doesn't add a lot of sense. And so, yeah, in that case, uh, NSIM, our proprietary simulator, uh, helps, helps us uh, to get a complete and full trace, even though it might implement JIT as well, and with that it works much faster. But uh, first, we were not uh, running uh, way too long anyways, and I didn't want to introduce additional uh, uh, variable here. Who knows how that JIT works in the end? Probably it might be buggy as well. I'm pretty sure everything is buggy. Uh, so to make things simple, I didn't use JIT and NSIM anyways. And uh, so we were we were able to capture those logs. And another interesting part of QMU, it is not instruction accurate in the sense of timing as well, even though there is a such thing called I counts where we try to mimic that in, uh, accuracy or at least uh, uh, to make sure that uh, instructions are executed with the same speed uh, on different executions. This is still not true. Uh, there are many discussions of that topic, but anyways, in case of NSIM, we may be sure that uh, interrupts at least which are caused by our uh, built-in core timers, which are in, uh, incremented synchronously with the execution of commands, happen uh, every time in the same uh, location, uh, in the same like cycle, uh, which we cannot say about QM you so yeah with you with QME, we won't be able to reproduce that at least that easily but uh here uh uh with ansim we may do that another interesting part here uh in that particular case, uh, we knew for sure that nothing, uh, no communication is happening between external words and worlds and so uh, our test, which means uh, no source of uh, interrupts were uh, going to happen unexpectedly at random point of time. So again, everything should be very predictable. And so, so we capture those two uh, traces, even though they were quite huge, like more than two giga or about two gigabytes uh, each. And so then we try to open that. So obviously you are not going to do that with your GUI tools, but so uh, with uh, VI or it's a wrapper of VimDiv, uh, you may get uh, that done nicely. And so here you may see that uh, we do have those logs. And so what we may see here, we have two different executions. So uh, one execution is uh, correct on top. And here what happens in iLink register, we write the address where we're going to return on the execution of RTIE instruction. And so then we execute that RTA instruction and we get exactly to that address. In case of wrong execution, we write the same value in iLink register, but then somehow we end up at the completely different address. If we disassemble our codes, uh, our binary of our application, we would uh, we would be quite surprised seeing that uh, that's actually entry point of an interrupt. So what happens, it looks like we are uh, jumping from interrupt handler right back into interrupt. What also suggests that might be true that uh, highest bits in status register which says that interrupts are enabled. Uh, 
so uh, due to those two uh, facts, we may conclude, so, so, or at least make an educated guess, that probably we are returning unexpectedly to the uh, interrupt handler. And so remember, we don't have any uh, source of interrupt other than timer and timer interrupt, which are served. So most likely we are not going to return here. So that, that seems to be a bug in this simulator. So uh, that's good. We are getting uh, to the bottom of that issue. And so uh, we know uh, who is misbehaving, but uh, then uh, what does it, uh, uh, what, what do we have out of that? And uh, so literally we, we've got to the bottom of uh, the software stack. Uh, that's the uh, executable platform, not even uh, a code of uh, for target. That's, a, that's a, like a real target, like a hardware, but in this case, that's a simulator. And uh, root cause, uh, seem to be simulated that that's okay uh, but on top we have python then we have uh, our codes then we have python script then we have uh, jenkins uh, which is written in java so we see a lot of things and uh, even though uh, we have engineers who will be fixing that simulator uh, that's still uh, not clear when we are going to get that fixed because uh, that problem might be not fixed that so soon and so still, uh, we don't know why that only happens when we execute it in Jenkins, but not uh, when executed manually. So uh, we want, uh, as an engineer, uh, we want to get all the answers uh, on all the questions answered. And for, for particular, we, in particular, we have the following questions. Why nobody faced that problem before? How Jenkins affects execution of the simulator? Because typically, we, you don't expect that to happen. And how to prepare a minimalistic test case for a simulator engineers to, uh, to deal with that? Because so far we were on, only able to reproduce that in the uh, automated setup. So uh, uh, let's try to get all the explanation. And uh, for that, we'll try to get uh, in the re reverse direction, seeing what we may do with that. So uh, we re return uh, one level up or back. It depends on how you look at that so from software stack uh, standpoint or from our previous adventure to the root cause and check if there is anything unusual we may want to, to examine. And so the only material things that we have are logs. And so even uh, in these logs already, we may have a couple of interesting observations. So first we see that line where execution stopped. That was the last line when uh, that's uh, sentry checker, sentry check scripts. Uh, locked into its uh, log file. So that's one thing. Another thing is uh, you see there are, uh, for some reason, two different PIDs, 979 seven, uh, nine, seven, nine and 1712. So that's also interesting. And so also what we see, you see a lot of things happening and so they all are happening in the same millisecond. So that doesn't look that right. And so those reads with uh, returning nothing, that that is all very suspicious. Uh, so. Uh, uh, to understand what's going on, uh, we need to uh, take a look at the uh, simulator. And uh, so that's why we go two levels uh, down the stack again and uh, see what's going on there. Uh, luckily, again, we had the luxury of having access to the simulator sources, and so that's always quite a benefit. And in that sense, open source software is very good because everybody may go uh, check those sources and so uh, try to build it and see what's going on. But uh, for us, uh, again, fortunately, it looked like open source because we got access to sources. And uh, in those sources, we decided to, to look for something uh, which could be easily found. So for example, those flags which are used in pod system call. And so here I mean exactly uh, those two. So we are talking about so pol in and pol pre. Uh, and so if we do a simple git grab, we may easily find a place where they are used. And so there we see a couple of interesting things. So first, uh, we do see exactly what uh, we expected to see that execution of the pol in a while loop. And also we notice that so uh, that function itself, even though it is not seen from here, is being used in a completely separate uh, thread. And so I think that explanation is quite easy. It is quite easy to implement it that way as separate threads, which uh, which keeps uh, checking what's in the input. And so that also already explains that so we have additional PID. Uh, the one is for like uh, CPU core emulation and one for that st standard input polling. Uh, 
so still, even though that codes uh, look quite valid, uh, we see a couple of interesting things. Uh, first, we expect that this poll uh, will block until we get uh, something useful. But uh, what we really see if we start debugging that with additional instrumentation or, or GDB, we see that we immediately get that one return. And that's something we saw in our logs previously, so it returns immediately. So why that might happen, it is quite quite unexpected happening. And another interesting thing uh, that uh, we see that that read returns uh, nothing actually, uh, returns zero, like uh, like as if uh, there is nothing in our input. And so that looks very suspicious. Uh, so uh, now uh, if uh, we consider a couple of things and in particular, uh, if we uh, consider that uh, that problem that we were seeing, it was not uh, uh, seen in the uh, other uh, attempt to to do that execution. So uh, while we were trying to uh, to create a minimal test case, we tried to use so-called uh, freestyle Jenkins job. In, in that case, uh, that problem was not reproduced. It only happens in that uh, new style, freestyle Jenkins jobs. And uh, uh, while we were discussing that with our automation people, uh, they suggested that uh, there is uh, quite an interesting uh, new thing in our in uh, Jenkin Jenkins uh, pipeline uh, jobs that they use uh, something which is called durable task plugin. Uh, so I go, uh, so I went to uh, Google that and uh, here you may see a couple of uh, links uh, which you might uh, become familiar with if that's of any interest. That's the most interesting article even though it is archived already because that website is not available any longer. But from that I was able to uh, figure out that uh, that durable task plugin uses no hub. And uh, so then I went and checked what that's no hub actually is and so uh, what does that thing do and among other things uh, what it does it uh, connects a dev null device uh, to the standard inputs of uh, of the process which is run under that uh, no hub and so that is already quite interesting but it uh, doesn't provide us any answer at this point so what we do uh, uh, I started to think about so what's uh, what's wrong with dev null and apparently uh, if we uh, look uh, at its documentation it says that uh, it, it exactly uh, always uh, returns end of file and it is always a date that uh, kind of data is always available and so that already explains a couple of things I think so uh, that explains why Paul returns immediately because nothing happens there we just return and then reads uh, reads nothing because it only returns end of file Okay, that's good. And with that, we are able uh, to reproduce that very easily. So, so that's our uh, simulator and steam. And so uh, these are properties describing the system, the processor, and that's our executable. And that's uh, definitely, that's simple. That allows us to reproduce the problem. Okay, so with that, we are done. So we now have a couple of answers. Um, that problem was nobody faced before by anybody because nobody in their sane mind would uh, connect devnull to the standard input. In Jenkins, that happens because of that uh, uh, plugin and that no how thingy. Uh, in the IRQ handler, uh, we see that happening because uh, in that loop, we may see that uh, we are looping infinitely and very fast. And that's why a lot of uh, request to reset interrupt happening there. And so, well, uh, there seems to be a race exactly there and minimalistic cases available. Uh, so uh, what can we do then? And even because even if that problem gets solved in the simulator, which we found so with instruction trace, it uh, still won't help us with the situation where with that infinite looping and host instructions will be wasted for nothing. And so for that, what we may actually uh, do, uh, we just may accommodate those peculiarities of dev null. So what we do for that uh, we add a read uh, which uh, where we monitor how many structure how many data we read and if we read nothing we first uh, get back to that cycle and not proceed with the execution of that interrupt handling code and also we add a sleep so we relax a little bit and so uh, don't spin here uh, infinitely so uh, that's what we may do here and even that fix allowed us uh, to get our CI back in the normal state and all the tests were passing completely normally. So that also uh, solves our initial problem. Uh, and so that's good. And so that's how we got uh, to the uh, top of the, our software stack again. Uh, and so uh, 
yeah, so that's how we went uh, down to the simulator and returned back and now we have all the questions answered. And uh, in the end, uh, uh, when the journey is uh, done, I think uh, I'd like to mention a couple of uh, things, even though there is no uh, particular uh, hard, or hard or particular technical suggestion that I have, but a couple of things uh, which really helped me a lot. So first, uh, and so in my opinion, the most important part for any engineer is to be curious. Uh, please don't keep questions without answers until you get uh, to the bottom of the problem, whenever, whatever uh, hack or uh, fix or workaround you implement uh, uh, is just another hack and it introduces more problems typically than you fix because uh, if you don't know a root cause, so that's a uh, root cause or even your uh, additional hacks on top of that will bite you inevitably or even your customers, your users. So please be generous to them and try to figure out what is actually wrong. In that case, uh, uh, we saw sporadic failures in the CI and they seriously got in the way. So uh, I really uh, couldn't stop thinking about that until I got to, to the bottom. And so now I have that peace of mind back which is which is quite good, I think. The next one, uh, it's good to be persistent in your search. So you have to be curious and persistent in getting answers to your questions. Because uh, uh, here in that presentation, we spent less than one hour, like 45 minutes by this moment, and so everything got explained, but really what's happened in uh, uh, that uh, reality uh, in real life, uh, it took me a couple of weeks uh, to get to the bottom of that. And a couple of times I thought that so that's completely dead and there is no explanation of anything. So I kept uh, looking and uh, talking to different people and trying to uh, find their solution and, and answer to, this, to those questions. And in the end, I was able to do that. So uh, that's the next thing. Uh, and then uh, another thing which is important is luck. Uh, but here I don't mean uh, like that pure luck so you're sitting on your sofa and so uh, everything falls into place. Uh, probably sometimes it happens but not that often, at least in case of our systems program, system software, uh, it barely happens like that so itself. Everything goes uh, worse and sideways but not so something good really typically happens. So for that luck to happen, you have to be uh, curious, uh, you have to be persistent and uh, look for different places, try different things, talk to people, and then eventually uh, that luck will appear as uh, finally working something, something, some hypothesis uh, being proved. And so with that, you may uh, move uh, forward. And so uh, more experience you have, uh, more uh, challenging tasks you solve, uh, more uh, developed and advanced is your gut feeling, which you will have that luck to, or uh, to happen much, uh, much sooner or like sooner uh, rather than later. And so that will help. In our case, uh, we were lucky because our instruction set simulator was instruction, uh, instruction uh, uh, allowed us to get so those traces and it was instruction accurate and so timing was so uh, the same all the time. So that was good. Logs were not that uh, large. We had so only two gigabytes, even though sometimes we have to deal with uh, literally terabytes of logs and so try to find something there. In our case, it was quite easy on that front. And so instructions diverged so quite soon. It was so like less than 500,000 instructions. So not that many, it's not even Linux kernel booting. Uh, what next? Uh, what is important so to have access to sources and uh, documentation as well as uh, knowledge database. In that sense, open source, which we are discussing on that conference is, uh, that's where it really shines because you have access to all the sources uh, and you may uh, do things, you may uh, look at sources, you may do your experiments, uh, you may improve those sources. And so uh, that's why improved project that you use. In our uh, particular exercise, it was very similar to that because we had access to sources, but anyways, you see in, in case of truly open source projects, so uh, that's what you get so uh, from the very beginning. Uh, another important part uh, is actually people around you. So, uh, Talk to people around you, discuss things that you have. Uh, people will help you debug problems. They, if not help debugging you, they will try to suggest something to you. And if not even suggest, uh, some discussions uh, might seed uh, an idea and so uh, that might be a good uh, starting point for, for your future developments. And that was exactly the case for me when I heard about that. Uh, 
plugin in Jenkins because I have no idea for what those Jenkins plugins are, but that helped me a lot. And uh, then uh, another interesting, important thing is uh, a good toolbox of uh, tools, uh, which you know uh, quite well, because uh, that helps you to be, to be productive and uh, successful. And so uh, again, move uh, fast to, uh, to your targets. Uh, because otherwise you'd be spending a lot of time trying uh, to solve very technical problems. But if you know your tools good, so like for example, that's a VI trick uh, with Vimdiv, uh, with uh, Grab, and you're uh, when you're looking through your sources uh, with you know different uh, editors, uh, different things which allow you for non-invasive uh, monitoring like logs, as trace, Linux perf, and all that. So knowing those tools and uh, have experience, having experience working with them uh, will obviously uh, significantly improve your efficiency debugging complex problems. So I think that's, uh, that's it what I wanted uh, to discuss today. Uh, thanks a lot for attending that presentation and uh, uh, take care of yourself and your relatives. Uh, we'll talk to you hopefully next time. Again, thanks a lot for, for watching this. Thank you, bye.